Bev had always loved going to the mall. When she was a child, it meant spending quality time with her mother, taking in the bustling sights of the stores, the enticing smells of the food court. When she was on her best behavior, she might be rewarded with a new toy, a soft pretzel, or a fistful of quarters to spend at the arcade. When she was a little bit older, first coming into her independent teenage spirit, the mall was a place of refuge, of freedom. Somewhere she could spend time with her friends away from her family's prying eyes, trying on outfits she'd never be allowed to wear to school, filling up on free samples, and imagining what it might feel like to be grown up. But as Bev had gotten older, left behind childish things, the mall had started to die. She knew it wasn't her fault, but it was sad to watch the source of so many simple joys wither away bit by bit. Stores closed one by one, driven out of business by the convenience of online shopping. Slowly but surely, the thriving center of her suburban youth hollowed out, turned into a graveyard of commerce left behind in the endless march towards the future. The colorful signs and advertisements for coming attractions remained, but there were no customers. The phantom smell of uneaten Cinnabon lingered in the air. The lights were on, but no one was home. And then, the lights went out too. The city didn't want to deal with the abandoned mall's upkeep, but they didn't want to go to the trouble of tearing it down either, so they just left it there. There was a running joke in town that the last security guard to lock up the place had left the doors wide open and just let nature get inside and start taking its course. The mall belonged to the wild plants and animals again, a strange artificial enclosure where raccoons could scavenge and deer could hide from hunters and their rifles. Then, of course, the small town had done what small towns do best. It fired up the rumor mill. Worried parents passed around email forwards warning about dangerous drifters hiding out in the empty mall, or gangs conducting violent initiations there. Teenagers dared each other to go inside before chickening out and going home, riling each other up with promises of ghosts or evil store mannequins ready to attack. Children at recess or on scout camping trips gave each other nightmares, with stories of giant monsters hiding in the old building, waiting for lost kids to wander inside so they could gobble them up. Bev knew none of that was true. It couldn't be. But she still couldn't shake the curiosity she felt about the mall that the town had left behind. What did it look like now? What had the elements, the time, the influence of intruders, both curious and destructive, done to the place? She had never planned to get into urban exploring, but then again, she hadn't planned to move back to her hometown after flunking out of law school either. It was strange, being back in such a familiar place that now looks so different. She could try to adjust, could let her life fade into a gray routine of diner breakfasts and drinks at the one bar in town and endless cups of coffee, or she could find a way to lean into the inherent strangeness of being back home. When she bumped into Daniel, her best friend from high school, and he told her all about his new, slightly illegal hobby, she knew she had found the answer. He had a crew of fellow urban explorers, a term they preferred to use instead of trespassers, a mix of friends from high school and other exploring enthusiasts he had met online. Bev was casually interested, but not entirely sure if the dangerous hobby was for her, until Daniel mentioned the mall. Like Bev, he had continued thinking about it long after its official closing. He wanted to go inside, to see what had happened to it over the years, and to see if there was a crumb of truth to any of the rumors about what lurked inside. Bev didn't take that part seriously, but her fascination with the old mall was enough to convince her to join the crew on their expedition inside. Daniel provided her with a list of rules. Turn off your cellular data once you get there so the police can't prove you were trespassing. Bring water, bring a flashlight, and wear all black. The group agreed to meet about a mile away from the old mall, where they would park their cars, discuss their plans, and head inside. Bev felt a bit silly, lying to her parents about where she was going at her age, but she didn't want them to worry about her. She told them she was going to meet up with some friends at a dance club just out of town. They didn't bother to ask what kind of club she would wear a black sweater, black pants, boots, and a black knit hat to. She was happy to leave without any more scrutiny. As she drove out towards the abandoned mall, she gripped the steering wheel with sweaty, nervous hands. What was she thinking? What if something went wrong while they were in there? The old building could be full of exposed wiring and loose beams just waiting to fall down and crush someone. 
There could be a nest of rabid animals ready to defend their territory. She tried to shake off the sense of foreboding. Daniel and his crew had done this sort of thing dozens of times before. Everything would be fine. By the time she pulled up to the meeting spot and parked her car, Bev had managed to calm herself down. This would be a fun, weird night of poking around the ruins of her childhood, the remains of a long-gone piece of suburban Americana, and that was all. Nothing bad would happen. She introduced herself to the rest of the group, a pair of brothers named Mark and Lewis that she recognized from high school, and a young woman named Rachel, who didn't look a day over 20. She must have been one of Daniel's internet buddies. Is this everybody? Bev asked. Daniel nodded. This is the crew for tonight. Ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Bev shrugged and laughed. Everyone else nodded in agreement, holding up their various flashlights, excited to get into the mall and explore. The place was every bit as fascinating as Bev had hoped it would be. A mixture of almost untouched storefronts, clothes rotting off their internal plastic mannequins beneath plastic signs advertising going out of business sales, and the wild world encroaching on what had once been a piece of suburban retail paradise. Spiderwebs hung along the walls, possums and rats skittered along the floors, vines crept along the remains of the fountain at the center of the food court that had long ago run dry. Bev screamed in shock as something ran across her foot, but when she cast her flashlight beam at it, she found that it was just a small raccoon running from the sudden intrusion on its home. Sorry, I'll keep my cool next time, she laughed it off. Eh, it's fine, it happens to me too, Daniel reassured her. You never quite get used to roaming around these places in the dark, but look, there's a lot of cool stuff to check out. He used his flashlight to illuminate the food court, specifically the soft pretzel stand. On top of the stand, leaning precariously to one side, was the enormous model of a soft pretzel that had once attracted hungry shoppers looking for a snack. Hungry? He quipped. Bev couldn't help herself. She pulled out her phone and snapped a picture. It was creepy. It was a little sad, but it mostly was a reminder of the simple joys of childhood. When the flash went off, it illuminated the darkness behind the stand, and she caught the glow reflecting in the eyes of the animals hiding back there. It unsettled her at first, but she reminded herself this place was theirs now. She and Daniel and everyone else, they were just visiting for the night. She checked her phone to see how the picture came out and frowned. Hey, Daniel, look at this. She held out her phone to show him, and his eyes widened. What is that? Can you zoom in? Bev zoomed in on the picture, and the two took a closer look. There in the background of the picture, just barely illuminated by the phone's flash, was a large silhouette. They couldn't make out any defining features other than a large round head and long, thin, noodle-like arms. Did this place used to have a mascot or something? Daniel asked. Bev shook her head. Not that I remember. Huh, Daniel sighed. Weird. Anyway, where'd the others go? He looked around for their flashlights or any other sign of life. Guys? Did you get lost? His voice echoed through the wide, empty space, but no one responded. Hello? Bev called out, a chill running down her spine. Only minutes ago, she had heard the others laughing and joking around as they explored the other end of the mall. But now, she couldn't hear a thing. Even the chittering of the rats had gone quiet. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream rang out and sent Bev's heart leaping into her throat. She and Daniel shared a look of deep concern as they both silently wondered if their worst fears had come to pass. Had someone fallen? Had there been an accident? She and Daniel followed the sound, looking for the source. Are you guys okay? Daniel shouted. The lack of response spoke volumes. Whatever had happened, the rest of the group was in big trouble. Bev quietly kicked herself for neglecting to bring a first aid kit. Finally, the two reached the other end of the mall, where the scream had sounded like it was coming from. But there was no one there. Only a dark, wet smear along the ground. It looked incredibly fresh, and it smelled metallic, violent. Bev didn't have to look more closely to tell that it was blood. Whatever had happened to the other three, she wasn't sure they were going to find them alive. Daniel reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a small pocket knife. It's not much, but just in case. He held it out in front of them as they walked, following the trail of blood. Something crashed to the ground behind them, and Bev whirled around to see a large steel beam only feet away. Any closer and they would have been crushed. Her eyes darted around, searching for any more potential danger. And then, she saw it. Up in the rafters, by the ceiling, was a strange figure. It was unlike anything she had ever seen. It was tall, impossibly tall, and pitch black. Its head was bulbous, with a pair of feline ears on top. She could make out a nose, a pair of wide white eyes with big dark pupils, and it was smiling. 
A broad, wicked smile filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Its hand looked like enormous white gloves. It was almost like she felt ridiculous thinking this, even as terror prickled at the back of her neck. But it looked like an old cartoon, the sort of thing her grandmother used to watch. Except those always looked friendly, even if they were a little unsettling. This thing, it looked evil. At first she thought it was some sort of twisted graffiti, or a statue left by a macabre experimental artist. But then, it moved. The creature tilted its head to the side, its smile broadening and its pupils dilated. It was looking right at her, and it was excited. Daniel, Bev whispered weakly. I see it too, he replied, his voice shaking. We need to go. We need to go now. Bev couldn't be sure what this thing would do if it caught them, but she didn't want to wait around to find out. She grabbed Daniel's arm and yanked him toward the exit. It took him a moment to start moving again, paralyzed by fear and confusion at the incomprehensible sight of the entity on the ceiling. But once he started running, it seemed like he would never stop. The two raced toward the exit, arms and legs pumping as fast as they could. Behind them, they could hear the creature chasing after them, but they didn't dare look back to see. Just before they passed the threshold out of the mall, Bev felt Daniel's hand slip out of hers. She spun around searching for him and watched in helpless terror as the long, long arms of the creature looped around his chest, pulling him back away from her and lifting him up in the air. It opened its massive mouth wide, wider, wider, then swallowed him whole. Bev screamed, but she forced herself to keep running, to save herself from the same fate. She could feel the entity's eyes on her back as she ran out the door, but once she escaped, she knew it would not chase her any further. For some reason, it was letting her go. She couldn't imagine if it was out of some kind of mercy, but she was grateful to escape with her life just the same. Bev stumbled into the local police station in a disheveled mess, face streaked with tears, and told the officer on duty what she had seen. He didn't believe her at first, asking her to repeat her story again and again. Every time she insisted that she knew what she encountered out there, or at least she knew that she couldn't explain it. The officer sat her in an interrogation room alone with a cup of coffee and asked her to wait until someone more qualified to help her arrived. She wondered if they were going to try and have her committed, if they had assumed she had lost her mind. But when a man in a white lab coat opened the door and greeted her, he said he believed her. He wasn't from a hospital or affiliated with the police. He was from a special organization, a foundation dedicated to investigating the unexplained. He was going to look into what happened at the mall. All he asked was that she tell him, in her own words, what she had seen. I don't know, she sighed. It looked like some kind of messed up cartoon cat. With a first-hand account of Bev and a series of confirmed disappearances that could all be traced to the abandoned mall, the SCP Foundation opened an official investigation. Wanting to eliminate as many potential complications as possible, the Foundation selected only one researcher actually entered the abandoned building, an operative with a great deal of fieldwork experience named Dr. Boggan. Though Dr. Boggan would enter the building alone, he would not be without support. He would be fitted with a microphone and camera, and his progress would be monitored remotely by a supervisor at a nearby Foundation site. If the need for backup arose, they would then be able to deploy additional security officers to enter the mall and extract Dr. Boggan if at all possible. He would also be armed with a standard pistol as well as a Foundation-issued flamethrower. With the team selected and the appropriate safety measures taken, it was time for Dr. Boggan to enter the mall and see just what he could learn about the entity dwelling inside. If at all possible, he was to neutralize it and bring it into containment alive so that it could be studied closely in a clinical environment. If live capture was impossible, he was instructed to terminate the being and bring its body in for a thorough autopsy. With his weapon already drawn and ready, and his eyes sharp and alert, Dr. Boggan walked into the empty mall. He saw a lot of what Bev and her friends had seen. The old pretzel stand, the dried up fountain, the creepy but harmless rows of faceless mannequins still locked in the same poses they had held for a decade. The spiderwebs made him a little nervous, but that was garden variety arachnophobia more than any real sense of danger. I don't know about this one, honestly. He spoke into his microphone to his supervisor on the other end. So far, seems like this place is your standard abandoned building death trap. Maybe our missing persons just weren't careful or properly trained to deal with navigating a place like this. Just keep looking, his supervisor ordered. Look for anything anomalous. Got it, Dr. Boggan nodded. He stepped on something with a loud crunch, 
He looked down to see the oldest, stalest soft pretzel he had ever seen. Anyone hungry? He quipped, turning his camera towards the unappetizing sight. Don't worry, I'll keep looking. He carried on walking, heading past a shoe store, a music store, some kind of novelty porcelain figurine store. He stopped at the toy store when something eerie caught his eye. You guys seeing this? He asked. What is it, Boggin? His supervisor replied. Just this creepy stuffed animal thing, the cat right over there. I don't like how its eyes follow me when I walk by. I don't see a cat. Sure enough, when Dr. Boggin did a double take, the strange cat-like toy was nowhere to be seen. Well, there's your first anomalous activity, he joked, though his heart was beginning to pound nervously in his chest. Keep looking. He nodded and continued his patrol of the area. He couldn't get the face of that thing that wasn't a toy out of his head. Its eyes, like the old Felix the Cat clock his grandparents had in their guest room, that thing had scared the hell out of him as a kid. He could never sleep in the room with it. All he could think about were its eyes, going back and forth, back and forth. He stopped in his tracks. He thought he could hear the sound of a ticking clock, clear as day, just behind him. He turned to look, but there was no clock. Nothing but darkness and emptiness, the same as everywhere else. He felt something suddenly tugging at his foot. He looked, expecting to see an animal pulling at his shoelace, something ordinary. But instead, he saw long, pointed fingers curling around his ankle. He couldn't see what the fingers belonged to, couldn't see a body, but could only see a long, looping snake of a shadowy arm curling around the corner up ahead. Before he could tell his supervisor what was happening, the hand had grabbed hold of him and was dragging him across the ground. The hand lifted him off the floor, then dropped him back down. He felt the lens of his camera break. Are you okay? We lost visuals. No! No, I'm not! He shouted as he looked up into the face of pure evil. Its pupils were dark and endless, its eyes bloodshot, its teeth bared. Do not send backup! I repeat, do not send backup! Oh god! Oh god! The audio cut to static, and the signal was lost. Dr. Boggin's body was never found. The entity referred to as Cartoon Cat was given the object class Keter, regarded as highly dangerous and nearly impossible to contain due to its reality-bending nature. Because it cannot be physically contained, the Foundation's solution to minimize Cartoon Cat's damage was to block off access to the abandoned mall. All civilians were warned of a deadly amount of radiation in the area. In order to deter them from conducting any more urban exploration, vandalism, or other visits to the location, any of the few survivors that have encountered Cartoon Cat are given amnestics, and their experiences are written off as substance-related or vivid nightmares. The empty mall may not be the only place Cartoon Cat has made its own, nor is it likely to be the only building of its kind that houses an anomalous monster. After all, when humanity decides to vacate a place, to leave it standing vacant and abandoned, you never know what might decide to move in. Now go check out SCP-096 vs. Siren Head and SCP-4158 Big Charlie for more things made by the inimitable Trevor Henderson.